Hey everyone, and welcome to another gear review episode of the Panasonic S1. Today we're gonna to be answering the question that I know a lot of you may have as well as we did. Is the Panasonic S1H worth the upgrade from the S1? Now, as the release of this video, the Panasonic S1H goes for roughly $4,000 on Amazon, while the Panasonic S1 you can find for roughly $2,000. Um, you can actually also find the S1 as a renewed item, which is very close to like new condition, for between $1,600 to $1,700, which is an amazing deal. Now, the S1 does not come with the V-Log upgrade, which is an additional $200, so do keep that in mind when you're pricing both things out. Panasonic S1H does come with that already integrated. So if you're looking at the additional features, you definitely need to consider getting the V-Log upgrade for the S1 because it unlocks not only just V-Log, but a lot of other settings that we're gonna be discussing in this video. Now we obviously know the S1H is better than the S1, but the question is, is it worth double the price tag of the S1? Now, a quick disclaimer, this review is going to be in relation to wedding videographers and not necessarily commercial filmmakers, which would slightly be a different topic. So keep that in mind as you're listening to all this information. So let's go ahead and dive in and get started. All right, here we go. These are the main topics that we'll be discussing in this video, size, weight, and ergonomics, resolutions and frame rates, features that are similar across both camera bodies such as a low light, image stabilization, battery life, autofocus settings, V-log, dynamic range, and those scenarios. And then lastly is firmware functionality. Now, let's go ahead and get started and break down all of these different options. Now I will have timestamps in the description of this video. If you wanna just jump to those sections and see what you have to say, you can check that out if you like. All right, first up, size, weight, and ergonomics. All right, the size of both of these cameras are pretty similar. Um, as you can see, the main difference between the S1H and the S1 is the back side. This is where it's a little bit more beefier to make more space for the bigger fan that it has, as well as the flip screen option that you do not have with the S1. So that is something to consider when you're looking at the size, is it is bigger on the back side. For the flip out screen, you get an entire uh, articulating screen just like you did on the GH5. And you also have an additional articulating um, section that pops out so that you can make more space for the HDMI cable if you wanna use this and an HDMI. Now, keep in mind this feature you can't really utilize if it is on a tripod or monopod because you have to access it here to pop it out and I can't access this when it's sitting flush. So that was one issue as I couldn't really utilize that feature on a, a, the, um, a tripod or monopod. Uh, with the S1, you have just a basic articulating screen that comes out but you have an additional way of turning it sideways. And that is maybe helpful if you're filming, say cocktail hour and you don't wanna draw attention to yourself when you're filming somebody. Instead of just looking at them and filming, you can tilt the screen sideways and look at an angle and it's a little bit less obtrusive and draws your attention to you filming those people. So that is something to consider. Obviously you can do the same thing with the S1 and even better. Uh, but those are the differences with the screen. Another difference with the S1H body is the uh, status LCD monitor area and this is where you can view a lot more of your settings that you're currently shooting in it gives you just more feedback you can also customize these settings and what's displayed but you get a lot of information such as white balance your shutter speed or angle ISO whether you're using the full sensor or super 35 uh, your actual frame rate and your uh, profile settings etc on the s1 you only get limited settings such as ISO f-stop shutter speed battery life, and a couple other things. So not that many options to consider. It's smaller on the S1 than the S1H. As you can see, you get a lot more real estate. Now because of that, they did move some of the buttons. So you have the on and off button on the S1, which is right here. And you can turn that on and off. And then on the S1H, they moved that up to near the shutter button. Now the one thing that I don't like about this is the on and off switch feels very identical to the scroll wheel right up here. So if you're just feeling around and you're wanting to change the setting and turn it off, 
uh, you might accidentally bump the scroll wheel and change your f-stop or shutter speed based off of your setting when you're trying to turn on and off. So that's something you just have to work with on muscle memory. I prefer the placement of the on and off button on the S1 over the S1H. Uh, with button layouts, everything's pretty much the same. The additional feature you get is you get a record button here and you get the big record button here on the S1H. With the S1, you only have the record button, the small one right here, uh, but we have set our shutter button to be our record button. So that doesn't really play into our consideration because you can just change the location of your video record button. Next up is weight. The uh, Panasonic S1H is roughly 2.32 pounds with a battery, while the S1 is 2.25 pounds. So they're very similar in weight. It's not much heavier with the S1H, uh, but that is something to consider. However, it does come into play whenever I'm using a gimbal. Now, I actually shot a wedding a few weeks ago with the S1H on a gimbal on my Ronin S the entire day, and I noticed that because it's got more weight on the backside, I had to have the uh, camera and lens shifted further to the back to actually balance it. And when I did that, it, it hindered my ability to go into undersling mode, which is one of the modes that I use a lot whenever I'm filming with a gimbal. Uh, that is something that kind of bothered me a lot, while whenever I'm shooting on the S1, that isn't an issue. I even tried the Panasonic 24 to 105 lens on both cameras, and it obviously balances well with the S1. However, with the S1H and the 24 to 105 lens, it only balanced at 24 millimeters, um, and no ND filter on the front of the lens. And I could, and also I had to take off the eye cup to get that much clearance, which you can just kind of pop that off with this button below it. And that was the only way I could get it to balance, which kind of limits and makes the motors work a lot harder when I'm zooming in on the gimbal. I usually like to set it to 50 millimeters and balance in the middle and then work with that. Uh, so that was an issue with the S1H is that it's much it's a little bit heavier, but it's bulkier on the backside and you would possibly need counterweights if you want to have clearance. So in that case with the gimbal, the S1 works much better on the Ronin S for the way that we shoot. If you're curious with our setup on the Ronin S and all the different accessories and what we recommend, you can check out this video that we have that explains all of our breakdown and all of our settings if you're interested in that. All right, looking at ergonomics, both of these feel great hand holding. So both of them grip really well. The S1H is slightly bigger, uh, but I could go handheld for the entire day and not feel too cramped with my hand as compared to filming on say a Sony or a Fuji style body. Even the GH5 is a little bit smaller and this feels a little bit more comfortable throughout the day if I'm going handheld. Uh, I'm not usually most of the time, but that is something to consider. Both feel really great for gripping it. Also, you have uh, SD cards. On the Panasonic S1H, you have a dual slots, which are both SD cards, while the S1 only has one SD card and a XQD card. Uh, that is something to note. Both of them will still dual record, so if you wanna have a video recorded to both uh, cards at the same time, they both offer that option, but you would need to uh, purchase an additional type of card, the XQD, in order to get that feature. We prefer not to shoot with the XQD card. The reason for that is I already have an issue not having a built-in SD card reader in the MacBook Pro. I have to get an actual adapter, so a second adapter would just be too much for me, and it's difficult if I forget it on a shoot and I need to dump footage. That is something to consider, so I just prefer to shoot with one SD card on the S1, but the S1H has the ability to have an additional uh, SD card so you can have both of those options. The S1H also has tally lamps. This is an additional feature. If I turn this on and I wanna go ahead and start recording, you can see that I have an extra tally lamp that lights up red when I'm recording on the front, as well as the back. You can see right here, there's an additional feature that uh, came with the S1H. And that is really helpful if you wanna remember that you're recording or your subject needs to know that you're recording. But in the scenario for weddings, I don't need the subject to see if I'm recording or not. Uh, you can also turn that feature off. Uh, but that is an additional uh, layout and a different option with the Panasonic S1H. All right, up next we have resolution and frame rates. Uh, that is a big 
deal here because this is one of the main differences between the S1H and the S1 are some of the frame rate options. You get a lot more features on the S1H than you do the S1. The S1H is built more as a cinema camera anyway than the S1 and we're going to break down a chart and try to make it as simple as possible with all the different frame rates and which ones are consistent between both and which ones has an advantage with the S1H. Now I'm not going to be discussing every frame rate option that you have with the S1H. I'm just going to be discussing what's most commonly used in scenarios for shooting weddings. Um, and we're also going to dive in and talk about the 10-bit options first. Now it's going to be assumed that all the settings are full frame except for the 4K60, which is going to use the Crop Super 35 mode of the sensor. So keep that in mind, everything's gonna be full frame, nothing's gonna change except for 4K60. Now, on the S1H, you do have 5.9K recording at 30 frames per second, as well as 24 frames per second. That is gonna be in full frame mode, and that will be at 200 megabits per second. Also, we have the 4K 60 and 48 frames per second. That is going to be the Super 35 crop. It's going to crop in to the Super 35 mode. That is also 200 megabits per second of data. Then we have 4K 30 frames per second and 24 frames per second. That is gonna be full frame mode. You do have the additional 400 megabits per second or you can use 150 megabits per second uh, whenever you're recording. You also have the ability to record at 1080p at 120 frames per second using the full frame sensor in 10-bit, and that is going to be at 150 megabits per second. Then you have the 1080p 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second, and that is uh, full frame as well at 200 and 100 megabits per second. For the S1, you only have a few limited options. You don't have as much options as the S1H. You do get 4K 30 and 24 frames per second. That is full frame and that is 150 megabits per second. And then you have 1080p 60 frames per second and 30 frames per second full frame. You do not get 1080p 24 frames per second 10 bit. I do not understand why that's removed. I can only go as low as 30 frames per second, but if I wanted to record for a longer period of time and only use the 24 frames per second, I do not have that option with this camera. The only way to get that feature is if I switch to the container AVC HD, which I want to stick in the MP4 or MOV container instead of the AVC HD, which I do not like the way it handles the files. Um, so that is a disadvantage is I don't have that feature, which I wish was there, and that would be at 100 megabits per second. So comparing both of these, the S1H has 5.9K, 4K 60 frames per second and 1080p 120 frames per second all in 10 bit. And, that, and the other two settings are similar between the cameras. Now when it comes to variable frame rate, both of these perform very close and very similar with the same settings. Variable frame rate will also be 8-bit and not 10-bit. Uh, for the S1H, you can shoot 4K 60 with the Super 35 crop and that will be 150 megabits per second. Also 1080p at 144 frames per second full frame, no crop. So you can go all the way up to 144 frames per second. Now that is with 24p in mind, so you can slow it down as slow as 16%. Uh, and then we have 1080p up to 180 frames per second, but it introduces a crop. With the S1, you can do 4K 60 Super 35. That's 150 megabits per second, which is the same as the S1. Um, then you can do 1080p up to 150 frames per second. But that is considering 30p, which means you can only slow it down 20%. Uh, and so the difference between these two in variable frame rate, this can, the S1H can slow down to 16%. The S1 can slow down to 20%. Those are pretty much the main differences because both also can shoot up to 180 frames per second, but in a cropped mode for variable frame rate. So the big advantage of the S1H over the S1 is obviously the kicker, which is 4K 60 10-bit internally, where the S1 you would have to record out to an external monitor, such as an Atomos recorder, so that you can use 4K 60 10-bit, but that is not internal. That's the one huge advantage on the S1H for frame rates and resolutions. 
Let's talk about functions and options that I feel are very similar between both of these cameras. Low light on the S1H, uh, this boasts dual native ISO. So at 640 ISO and 4000 ISO, you have a very clean image, which means you kind of have a lot more headroom to get uh, lower light scenarios. You can shoot a lot higher ISO with a cleaner image. On the S1, it does not boast dual native ISO from Panasonic. However, if you bump up your ISO to 4000, just like you do on the S1H, you will notice that your image gets really clean all of a sudden. If you're shooting at 3200 ISO, it could look a little noisy, and then once you switch to 4000, instantly the image looks really clean and usable. So in my tests shooting with both the S1H and S1 in low light, they perform almost identical. I haven't noticed a big difference. Um, whenever we're shooting weddings in real life scenarios, the low light is insane with this camera, which is a huge deal for me. I can shoot easily up to 10,000 ISO with a very clean image and it's usable. I would not go above 16,000 ISO. That is where I feel I would draw the line if I needed to. Ideally, I'd stick to 10,000 ISO, but I could push it to 16,000 ISO. But the low light on these cameras both perform great and is absolutely phenomenal and is a big deal. Rarely am I going above 6,400 ISO, but there was a scenario where we couldn't light, we were shooting an event, and I had to shoot at least 10,000 to 16,000 ISO, and the image turned out really great. Only whenever I got up to 20,000 ISO did I have to introduce and use something like a neat video to clean up the noise, uh, but for the most part, these cameras do great in low light. Let's talk about IBIS. When it comes to image stabilization, both cameras perform pretty much the same. I have not seen any difference whenever I'm shooting on the S1 versus the S1H. We would have the same lens and I would just change them out. Both boast the same type of response. It says the S1H has a slightly better advantage by maybe like a half stop of image stabilization, but in my case, I can't see the difference. Both perform absolutely well and they're both great for image stabilization even more improved than the GH5, which was a game changer for us when it came to image stabilization. As for battery life, these cameras are awesome. Um, both use the exact same battery, so if you are invested in the S1 and you're wanting to add the S1H to your arsenal, you can use the same batteries. You don't have to invest into a different set. Uh, for a wedding, whenever we're shooting, say, 10-bit vlog and image stabilization on the entire day, we would use two to three batteries per camera. Now this is absolutely phenomenal whenever coming from Sony, we would use about 11 batteries between cameras and then the GH5, I would even use up to four or five batteries. So being able to shoot two to three batteries, I'd usually shoot two full batteries and maybe a little bit into the third battery. Um, because you have additional frame rate options and settings on the S1H, you could probably use an extra additional battery just as a precaution. So I would say the S1, I would use two and a half batteries for a wedding. The S1H, I would use uh, three batteries, maybe three and a half batteries. Um, but the battery life on these are absolutely phenomenal and this is great advantage with the Panasonic S-Series camera bodies. Now let's discuss autofocus. Uh, whenever I uh, was renting this S1H, I was trying to compare if it improved on the S1. And in my, uh, my end results, I did not see a difference in autofocus ability on the S1H. Both perform about the same with autofocus. Now with that being said, you can only use certain lenses that have a good autofocus response. Shooting with the Panasonic 24 to 105 lens here, uh, I noticed that it would lock in on the subject about 70 to 80% of the time, and it would be usable for that amount of time. Uh, I would cycle between the two different modes, which would be the one area of focus, and then also the face, body, and eye detect feature that you have. Those are the two main that I would cycle between, and I also set my speed and sensitivity to both plus one, which felt ideal for our scenarios. If you are considering other lenses like the Sigma lineup or any kind of adapted lenses, you are gonna have an issue with autofocus. Uh, the best lenses for autofocus are gonna be coming from Panasonic since they are built for this camera. So the Panasonic 24 to 105 L mount, 24 to 70, and then also the 51.4. Those lenses uh, have apparently had the best results. I've only used the 24 to 105, so that's the only one I can speak about. When it comes to Sigma, there are a few lenses that we use. Uh, this one is the 14 to 24 f2.8 
lens. And this lens is absolutely phenomenal. It's also great if you're shooting 4K60 with the Super 35 crop because shooting this lens, you still get a really nice wide lens if you want that feature when you're moving into the Super 35 crop. Now this cam this lens was one of the three lenses from uh, from Sigma that actually integrate best with the DSLR lineup. So you have the the pan uh, the Sigma 14 to 24 2 8, the uh, the Sigma 35 1.2 and then also the Sigma 45 2.8. Those three lenses were built mainly for the uh, the mirrorless uh, camera system, so those respond the best with autofocus in my initial tests. The other lenses like that are all made for the DSLR cameras or other cameras that have just been adapted with L-mount do not have the same functionality. For instance, I'm recording on the Sigma 51.4 L-mount right now, and the autofocus is too slow and doesn't stick to the subject as often, and so it's not usable. But shooting on the 14 to 24, this one works really great, and I can use that also about 70% of the time it locks on and follows the subject really great. Um, so those are the things to consider. I also have a, uh, a Canon to L-mount adapter, so the EF to L-mount adapter so that I can use Canon glass, which we have the 18 to 35. This will use the crop of the sensor, Super 35, so that does crop in, but it's also a 1.8, and then also the Canon 135 F2 lens, and that is also used with the adapter. So these are the main lenses that we have, the 24 to 105, the 14 to 24, the 51.4 Sigma, 18 to 35 Sigma, and then the Canon 135. We're still working with a few other lenses, but those are the main ones we're using for an entire wedding day. But autofocus only works on a few of the lenses, and so if you're looking to invest into Sigma lineup, and you're like, I want this autofocus to work great for L-mount, it does disappoint and it's not great and reliable. This is the weakest link in my opinion with the S1H and the S1. If it had great autofocus similar to the Canon lineup or say the Sony a7 III, it would be amazing. It would cover all uh, the check marks I want for this lens and this camera system. However, this is something that does have an issue for me and doesn't produce the results that I like. So a lot of the time I am using manual focus, um, in most scenarios instead of autofocus. But when I'm on a gimbal in the 24 to 105, I can be wide and shooting and tracking a bride coming down the aisle and it's tracking her. I can zoom in really quickly and instantly it tracks as well. And in those scenarios, it's perfect. So whenever I'm having to track and not worry about manually focusing with a recessional or processional, it works phenomenal. I just wish it responded and was working a little bit better than what it performs. But we don't get everything we want, do we? Another topic of discussion is dynamic range with V-Log. Uh, the V-Log that comes in the S1H is the same that comes with the S1, and they both perform very similar. Whenever I've looked at all my tests, which we filmed in very bright scenarios with a lot of shadow, like we'd put a couple in the shadow and there'd be a bright scenario in the background, the highlight and shadow retention on V-Log with both of these cameras are pretty much the same, so I haven't noticed a difference in V-Log between both of these. However, if you're shooting with better frame rates and better options, you do get a little bit more functionality, but uh, in my test with dynamic range, there's not much of an advantage with the S1H over the S1 when using V-Log, besides using different resolutions that have a cleaner, a clearer picture and a sharper image. But V-Log does do amazing compared to say a natural profile. So I wanna show you an example. Here I was shooting a restaurant and they were cooking and there was a fire in the background and there's a lot of shadow and highlight information there. And I shot with a natural profile that we mainly shoot with on the GH5. And you can see here we're clipping on the uh, fire in the background. Now whenever we switch to V-Log, you can see that it retains those clipping levels of the fire in the background and gives us a way cleaner image. So in that case, the V-Log is outstanding and works really well compared to other profiles that you're shooting with. So for us shooting weddings, we are now switching to filming in V-Log because of the dynamic range on the S1. It is absolutely amazing and we love it. Uh, compared to the natural profile. But if we do want to shoot 4K60 and we don't have V-Log as an option on the S1, then I will shoot in our natural profile, which is the same settings that we've used on the GH5, 
we put them on the uh, the S1 and get very similar results and we really like the way the skin tones look. We do have to keep in mind of blowing out uh, highlights though because we can't retain it like you can with Vlog. Also, the shadows are a little bit darker in the natural profile compared to Vlog. You can check out a link here that we have about our settings on the GH5 and what we've dialed in for optimal skin tones when using camera profiles on the GH5 as well as the S1. Lastly, let's talk about firmware functionality. Now this is where I get really upset with Panasonic because a lot of these functions that are in the S that are in the S1H are not available in the S1, yet some of those features are also in the GH5. So just skipping it on the S1 really upsets me that they were doing that just to force you to get the S1H, which is pretty lame in my opinion. So I'm going to list out all the different um, firmware functions that I feel could be implemented into a firmware update on the S1 that would make it pretty close, if not similar to the S1H. So let's go ahead and take a look. Synchro scan. Synchro scan is a setting in the S1H as well as the GH5 that helps you really dial in your exact shutter speed that you want so that you can remove any kind of lines that are coming from uh, certain lights at receptions and causes havoc on your screen. Um, usually you can dial in uh, you know, change your shutter speed and that can usually fix it. But there are certain scenarios where it's ideal to have synchro scan as an option so you can really fine tune and remove those lines uh, altogether. Uh, that is also set up as a function button. So you can set that up as a function button on the S1H, which is really helpful. I don't know why they removed it from the, they didn't have it on the S1 when they do have it on the GH5. Another setting that they have on the GH5 as well as the S1H is shutter angle. You can use shutter angle degree instead of shutter speed. And that is uh, one setting that I used to love on the GH5. It's on the S1H. Um, we like to shoot with uh, shutter angle. So whenever we're changing uh, frame rates, it automatically adjusts for us and just reduces the amount of clicks that we have to do to get the result that we want. That's another fail from Panasonic on my end. Another option is the record quality my list function where because this has so many settings like 20 plus settings of frame rate and resolutions, you can save your favorite to a list and uh, access that instead of having to cycle through all the different options to choose that. So you can set that in here. You can also set that to a function button and quickly access it and go through say your favorite four settings that you're using on a wedding day. Uh, the S1 is more limited so it doesn't have that ability because you already only have about five different options in the MOV container uh, option whenever you're choosing frame rates and resolutions. You only have about five options here. S1 you have 20 something options so dialing it down to a specific list is a, uh, an additional feature that I love on the firmware functionality on the S1H. Another amazing feature is the red record frame indicator. Now, I don't know if you saw that earlier whenever we were looking at the tally lamps, but if I went ahead and push the record button, not only do the tally lamps light up, here, but you also get, I'm gonna see if you can see here, you get a red bar that goes around your screen to let you know that you are recording. Now, because I'm mainly shooting with a monitor on our camera, I'm not looking at the tally lamps as a reminder if I'm recording, but being able to have the red frame indicator light up whenever I'm recording, that sends through HDMI to our monitor so I can see on my monitor I am actually recording. Super helpful. I would love to see that implemented into all the camera Panasonic lineups that are using video features because that is an amazing feature and I feel like that could easily be a firmware update, so we shall see. Another function is video frame marker. That is where you can set your aspect ratio grid lines so that you can make sure that if you're wanting to film and you know you want to crop and post to say uh, two to three, five to one aspect ratio or two to five, two to one aspect ratio, you can uh, properly compose your shots knowing how you're going to crop it in post. That feature is not on the S1, yet it is on the GH5 so that you can set up your grid lines. Now it's more limited on the GH5, but you still have those options. The S1H has a lot more options that you can dial in, but that is not on the S1. Another function I wish was on the S1. Also, waveform and vector scope ability to view is on the S1H. A lot of people were talking about this feature that they loved and they really wanted that. For me, I personally don't use that feature at all because I would mainly use it on our small HD monitors and being able to swipe over to a different slide that has that and then to view it, 
set up my, uh, compose my shot and properly expose, then swipe over is a quick way of doing that instead of using it on here. It does block the real estate of the screen, and in that scenario, I don't wanna use that feature, but you can set it to a function button as well, so you can quickly turn it on, check, and then turn it off if you want. Uh, that's not a big feature for me that I was wishing in the S1, but that is something to note for those that do care about that feature. Image area of video. That is another function that is on both of these cameras where you can choose to view uh, full frame mode or super 35 mode or even pixel to pixel mode. Uh, the one thing that the S1H has that the S1 doesn't is you can set that to a function button. You can quickly access it and turn it on and then switch between it. So if you're filming and you wanna change your, uh, your focal distance, maybe you wanna be able to crop in to get a different uh, field of view, you can do that really quickly on the S1H. When the S1, you have to go into your menu, maybe your saved list and access it. So it's just a few more clicks. I wish that was a quick key where I could set that up but you can't on the S1, you can only do that on the S1H. Also, let's talk about anamorphic. That is a feature that is really highly discussed and showcased on the S1H. It's also available on the GH5, but not on the S1. Now the GH5, I understand it being on that because it's a micro four thirds sensor and a lot of lenses for anamorphic shooting is available for that, uh, that mount option. Uh, so we actually shot an elopement all on anamorphic glass using $20,000 lenses. You can watch this video up here and see the film that we created, also behind the scenes video of shooting anamorphic with the GH5. Um, it is awesome that you can have that feature on the S1H, but you have all those additional frame rates. You can shoot in a four by three aspect ratio um, and then de-squeeze. All those settings are in the S1H. You don't have any of those settings on the S1. So if you're considering anamorphic shooting, S1 is not gonna be the option for you. You're definitely gonna want the S1H for that feature. So there you go. Hopefully this video is helpful in comparing the S1H to the S1 for wedding filmmakers. As a recap, here are the things that it comes down to for me when considering purchasing the S1H over the S1. First up is the hardware features. The S1H has a, um, a flip out screen. That is an advantage. Also you have a larger status LCD screen up here. You also have the tally lamps and you have dual SD cards. Now for the dual SD cards, that is great to have, but it's not an ideal thing. It's not a big game changer for me. I can just get an uh, XQD card or just decide to shoot with one SD card, which I have been doing. That doesn't matter to me. The larger uh, LCD status screen on the top, I usually don't view the top of the screen anyway because I'm using a monitor. So in that case, it doesn't matter to me. I also don't use the tally lamps because again, I'm using a monitor. So looking down at the screen or looking down at the camera to look for the record button is not something that I normally do. Uh, however, the record red frame, frame indicator is something that I would love to use. Uh, but that's the main features on the S1H over the S1. But again, those features don't really make it worth the price upgrade for me but let's go ahead and talk about resolutions and frame rates. The S1H has three major settings over the S1. First is pretty much shooting 6K, also shooting 4K 60 10 bit, and then also 1080p at 120 frames per second full frame. Those are the three main uh, options that are uh, it's superior to the S1 and the main things to consider. Uh, now, whenever we're shooting weddings, 6K I'm not really using. If I did, it would mainly be using for maybe toasts or a second B cam for valves so that I could crop in. But for the most part, 4K is doing its uh, is doing a great job for me. 6K is not something I'm mainly using. 4K, I am, so the 6K doesn't bother me. 4K 60 is the biggest thing with 10 bit to consider. Also shooting in 1080p at 120 frames per second full frame 10 bit is pretty awesome as well. We shot a wedding, getting a lot of dancing shots. It's a really clean image. It looks really great and it doesn't crop in. So 4K 60 and 120 frames per second at 1080 are the two things that would definitely make me consider the S1H over the S1. And lastly to consider are the firmware functions that are found in the S1H. You have synchro scan, you have shutter angle, you also have the record frame indicator, video frame marker, so setting up your aspect ratio, uh, waveform and vector scope features, and then also the image area of view, you can set that to a function button. Those are the functionalities with firmware that are advantage on the S1H over the S1. But breaking it down, synchro scan, I'm rarely using all the time, I maybe one or two times in a year where I'd actually utilize that setting, so that's not a big deal for me. Uh, shooting angle shutter is 
something I would love to do, but it's not a game changer where I can just change my shutter speed instead. So shutter angle isn't a big deal. Also the red record frame indicator is the biggest thing that I love functionality wise that I wish was on the S1. Really helps me know whenever I'm filming, we constantly are shooting sometimes and noticing, oh, we forgot to push record or we were in the opposite cycle where we thought we were recording when we weren't and when we weren't recording, we were. So it's kind of a little bit of a, a thing to consider that is an awesome function in the S1H. So do these things merit the $2,000 price tag for the S1H over the S1. Honestly, in my opinion, for filming weddings, I would pay $3,000 max for the S1H. So, no, we will not be upgrading from the S1 to the S1H. The biggest features that we loved in the Panasonic S1H that would make us consider switching would be 4K 60 frames per second at 10-bit and the dual SD card slots. And that is pretty much it when comparing both of these cameras and what I'm basing my decision off when we're deciding if we're gonna be upgrading to the S1H over the S1. Again, this decision is in relation to wedding videography and not commercial filmmaking, which in that case, this would be worth it for $4,000 because I would be utilizing all those additional features that I'm not really utilizing for weddings. So just keep that in mind. For weddings, I am not recommending the Panasonic S1H. I would recommend the S1. So the question I have for you, is the Panasonic S1H worth it or do you care enough about those additional features? Let me know in the comments below and we can continue to have this discussion. If you found this video helpful, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you don't. We will be releasing more content every month and I don't want you to miss when our next video goes live. Again, thanks so much for watching. My name is Kaylin from White & Reverie. I'll see you in the next video.